Um, yeah, so I just want to give a, like, a very high level talk about Jam. Um, this is not going to be like technical. You don't need any sort of background. You probably should know a little bit about blockchain and how it works generally. Um, but I also want to offer um, the ability for anybody in the audience at any point during the talk to ask questions. I will repeat your question if you ask it so the stream can hear it. Um, but please, like, stop me uh, at any point if you want something clarified or whatever else. Um, we're going to start with some sort of high-level context around why we're doing this in the first place. So why do we even build decentralized systems? And why is Jam becoming a thing? Jam is becoming a thing because we're realizing some of the constraints of current blockchains as ledgers, right? So you can see this happening throughout history, very modern history, uh, especially, as the internet becomes more constrained. So there are, as I would say, kill switches um, among uh, large platforms that have sort of monopolies over a lot of the internet. And even in my lifetime, I'm not very old, um, even within my lifetime, um, many of these platforms have become more and more centralized as time goes on. Um, power tends to centralize, infrastructure tends to centralize, and social networks tend to centralize, uh, social graphs, and all of the centralization by large tech companies means that you do not have control over this data. Something can just go offline. And here I have a few examples. Um, you may not agree with what some of these say. You may not agree with what some of these platforms have done. However, I would posit that it does not matter. The whole reason that we're doing this stuff is that anyone can build anything that is unstoppable. And these are things that have been stopped. And these are things that have affected real people. So in 2021, um, Google is, is in the Play Store, Apple Play Store, um, and AWS kicked off Parler, which was a right-wing social network. Again, you may or may not agree with this, um, but this, the effect of this was that the entire website, with all of the social connections, all of the data, it was basically dead in 24 hours. No one could access this, right? And we've seen the same thing with um, Cloudflare, for instance. Cloudflare has deplatformed certain websites, um, which makes the website inaccessible, and then they had to move to you know, more decentralized networks in order to, for people to use them. Um, in 2022, um, PayPal and Patreon uh, cut off a bunch of creators. So they changed their terms of service, um, and they put a bunch of people out of money, basically. This really affected a lot of people. And the payment processors is a very important uh, part of this. So it's not just decentralized hosting, it's also decentralized finance, right? And so we have both of these things in blockchain, um, but we should have more of them and like have them more composable. So um, in 2023, uh, Reddit did a big purge of a lot of communities. Uh, there was a ton of history, a ton of you know, people made connections, whatever, and the data is just gone. It just wiped off the face of the internet, basically. Luckily, we have things like the Wayback Machine, uh, which archive these things. However, the Wayback Machine can also be uh, <laughs> asked by the authorities to take th certain things off of their archive. And um, for anybody who doesn't know, the Wayback Machine is, uh, I find the Wayback Machine, as, it's fantastic. It's so good that it exists, but it's very fragile. And I say fragile because I know the way that it works. <laughs> and. Uh, Basically, I can hear the, the, the hard drive spinning up every time I access a page on it. Um, all of the Wayback archives are located in San Francisco. Um, so if something happened to San Francisco, then the Wayback machine would no longer exist. Um, and in 2024, um, there's been a lot of uh, cracking down on misinformation, policing of speech, one way or the other. And all of these large platforms have the power to do this. Um, and basically, this is just an illustration of all of the different ways that you can get screwed over by different levels of the internet. So you say you want to write a website. You have a great idea. People want to use it. But then you are at the mercy of all of this stuff. Like app stores can ban you. You can be cut off by payment processors. 
Um, your cloud hosters can de-platform you. Your CDNs, like Cloud Cloudflare, can just block you. Um, DNS can be seized. Governments seize DNS all the time. And you can be blocked at the ISP level. And all of these things have happened already. Every single one of them have happened. So some uh, examples of this are the UK Online Safety Act, which is kind of an older concept, but has recently come into uh, the spotlight because they have implemented age verification for adult content. And originally, this was specifically called the porn ban. However, um, if your website is not compliant with this and is like a hoster of just like generic images, then they will just sue you or say, like, you can't do that. Um, so we see like large image hosting sites such as Im Imgur um, just completely block the UK because they're like, we don't want to have to be liable for this. We don't want to have to put all of the money into implementing this. So we're just going to block the UK. Great. Um, in Australia, they have something even uh, more extreme where they are implementing age verification in order to uh, ban all under 16-year-olds from social media. But this is the thing, right? It might sound good in practice. You're like, oh, yeah, I mean, that seems fine. But it's not going to stop there. Like, it never stops there. And in Europe, we have something called uh, chat control, uh, which is basically pre-scanning of chat messages and, and uh, images before they leave your device. And this would compromise end-to-end -end encrypted messengers completely. And this is the second time they very recently, within the past week, have it got shot down. Uh, but they're trying again through different avenues. And people use different arguments to say why this is good, but it is all mass surveillance. So do we want this to be with the new web? I don't want it to be the new web. Like, it doesn't have to be. And that's why I'm talking to you about this. So a way around this is decentralization. Um, so if you have 1,000 plus providers around the world, which are unique, which are not colluding, but they work together to run your applications, and no one controls all of them, or a majority of them, or even close to a majority of them, then you can achieve this unstoppability. This is your stereotypical George Orwell quote. Um, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. So I just want to talk about this a little bit. Um, the first use case I see is for Jam is the uncensorable press. So Jam offers some new primitives, which are interesting for things like publishing. So previously, in, which is the case for Polkadot and a lot of other blockchains, the DA layer is coupled to the, sort of the way the blockchain works. right? However, in Jam, the DA layer can be used independently. And since you have a DA layer, which can use, be used independently, and the DA layer is very large, you can store things, um, and you can keep storing them as long as someone wants to pay for that storage. So if someone finds something like a WikiLeaks dump interesting, then someone can pay for it, and it will stay up. And no one can stop this from happening. So this is something that cannot be blocked, right? Um, and the way that it works, you know, in a, in a decentralized way, it can't be seized. It will always be accessible. Um, this is another example that I wanted to touch on. I touched on the Reddit uh, stuff earlier. But another big thing that's happening now is Discord is becoming a massive walled garden of information. <coughs> sorry, of information. So back in the day, when I was much younger, um, forums like P PHBB, et cetera, uh, were all the rage. Like, you had niche forums for like, all kinds of hobbies. And it was great. You could find all the information. It was all indexed by Google or whatever AltaVista you were using at the time. Um, and you could find tons of information. But all of these independent forums, which were run by independent internet communities, are now on Discord, or they're on Reddit. And so this, you know, these two big companies own so much information about hobbies, about video games, about like just tons of information about something you might want to know about. Luckily, Reddit is indexed by Google, kind of. Their own search sucks. Um, but Discord is basically a black box. 
and you have to go find that information. And this is bad, right? If Discord goes down or is something happens to it, all of that information is lost. And that's horrible, right? So cre creator and community independence is really important, and it also ties into payment. So if you are a creator and you say you want to make like a video game forum or like maybe a better example is like a video game wiki for like a new video game nobody's done it before um, and you want to get paid for your work um, and you want to keep giving up keep giving people who subscribe to you updates for this for, for, for this wiki um, platforms like patreon take massive cuts so if you want to create a community or if you want to create paid content as a creator the, the value extraction is huge and the centralization is huge Another uh, use case is if you're being watched, you don't organize. So this is more in the uh, way of thinking of uh, political uprisings um, in various countries. We've seen this uh, very recently in Nepal, where they actually voted in their new prime minister on Discord, um, which is great. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, but again, it's Discord, right? Like, if the government wanted to block Discord, they probably could. So this decentralization aspect is really important. And if someone is, someone is surveilling you, you are much less likely to do this organization because you are at risk. So I, as a use case number three, I think Jam is very good at collaboration. And this means both collaboration in the sense of uh, collaborative services that can be provided by or on the Jam DA. Um, as well as like assets. So I think the way that Jam works um, really enables this because you can compose these services of data and financial to come together to, to create really powerful platforms for people who need to collaborate like this. Um, I think that's very powerful and it's, it's very empowering um, for people who need this kind of thing. And of course, information wants to be free. So this is a quote um, from a really old hacker conference. It's a, it's a paraphrase quote. Um, but it resonates with the hacker community. It resonates with a lot of people because information does want to be free. For example, if you leak something, people will probably copy it, disseminate it, uh, make it available on the internet. Um, and the more information that's available, uh, the more information that's available that people do not want on the internet, um, the more you see these takedowns. And these takedowns can be done by governments trying to cover stuff up, they can be done for IP reasons, whatever. But information does want to be free. So my use case number four is human knowledge. Um, if you have a content, if you have the ability to create a content distribution system, which I believe you could do on Jam, then you get rid of sort of this, you get rid of this whack-a-mole uh, that governments play with certain websites where, for example, Sci-Hub, right? You have uh, a ton of human knowledge hosted for anyone who can access the website. However, you know, it's a, a legal content, so governments uh, tend to take it down. But it, it is a game of whack-a-mole because these, these sites always come up again and again and again and again over over a decade now, um, things like Pirate Bay, et cetera. And it's obvious that people care enough to keep these things online. So if people are willing to care to keep these things online, then something like the Jam DA is really good for this, because if people care, then they're obviously paying for the hosting. So if you pay to keep it alive, it will be available. And if it's distributed, then you do not have to worry about about this problem, basically. Um, so then you can have common platforms for common goods. Um, and the discoverability uh, could be better because you don't have to have these like hidden URLs. Um, you could still have you know, privacy layers, uh, you know, encrypted, um, encrypted transport, dark web type stuff. It's all possible. So when deplatforming destroys you, when censorship, when censorship is real, when permanence matters, when extraction is unbearable, you need jam. And a lot of, a lot of the points that people make when I bring stuff up like stuff like this up is, oh well, you know, 
the current government's not going to do anything bad with this. It's fine, like it's limited in scope. But governments change, laws change, nation, nation states change. So it's always, it's always the case that tomorrow might not be fine. And that sounds like a little bit <laughs> pessimistic of me, but I don't mean it in that way. I mean it in a take care of yourself and take care of your communities because things might not always be fine. So in general, I believe there to be three truths. Every platform, like Web2 platforms, centralized Web2 platforms, are prisons. Every kill switch, like I talked about earlier, will eventually, will eventually be used if they have the power to do it. And infrastructure is power, and that's why we're building infrastructure. In general, I think this is the gist of it. You get it, it's, it's very important. And I think that the architectural capabilities of Jam really allow these things to come out due to the way that the data availability works, the storage works, and the service composability works. So all of these things can be built, and I believe they will, build, will be built. So build on Jam and be the rebellion. Yay, Aaron, that was so good. I, I feel like we just became best friends because I love everything you just said. We're gonna do questions from the audience. There's so many of you, I know somebody has a question for Aaron. We do have a microphone for you. Okay, here we go. Super quick. We love this. Hello, Aaron, thank you. Why do you think Jam is especially good for those use cases compared to Polkadot? Yeah, so I knew this was going to be Can a question. Can you repeat it too, just oh, for sorry. the translators? The, That's the, okay. The, qu the question is, um, why is Jam good for building these services rather than on Polkadot? So as I said at the beginning, I believe this to be especially possible on Jam due to the capabilities and size of the DA layer. So the, t the DA layer will be two petabytes, I believe. Um, and it is accessible without having to access uh, on-chain storage. So you can use the DA layer to do very interesting things. Um, and the DA layer, you can think about the DA layer as memory, right? So you can store things in memory, you can retrieve things from memory, and you don't even have to touch the blockchain to do that. Um, you can, uh, like, you need to pay for the storage, but the way that it works is much more flexible and generic. So you can build services on Jam, which access DA, which access payment rails, um, which access smart contracts, and then compose these together in ways that we cannot do on Polkadot now. Very good. We have time for one more question. Yeah. So when I read the original gray paper, the first thing that came to my mind was a switching services layer and it would extend beyond Polkadot as well, from what I interpreted. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that or discuss that a little bit? Oh, what kind of layer, sorry? Um, what, I would con what I would consider a switching services layer. So information interchanging, whether it could be financial or data or otherwise, that could um, travel even beyond Polkadot. Um, I think the question is, tell me if I'm wrong, I think the question is, um, is there a way for services on Jam to travel to other networks? Yes, I mean, it's the same as Polkadot in that respect. Bridges will still exist. We can, um, you know, Hyperbridge, Snowbridge, all of these bridges uh, will still exist. Um, but Jam does have unique capabilities that maybe, um, since these bridges are mainly at the moment, uh, for assets, um, we will see what what bridges we had, we need in the future to like make them more generic to work with Jam. If people want to manipulate data on Jam, amazing! Thank you so much, Aaron. That was so great.